Okay, welcome everyone to my continuation of what is category theory. Today I would like to talk about maps between maps between maps. Arrows between arrows between arrows. Um, in other words, I would like to talk about natural transformations. So what are natural transformations? I think they are pretty scary if you see them for the first time. And I'll try to like to demystify them a little bit in this video. Because they're really just a very, well, uh, obvious notion if you want. If you would think about it, it would need to write it down yourself, you would probably come up with this definition. They're not as scary as, as they look like. They're, of course, more fancy than functors because they're maps between functors. And of course, they kind of need to talk about all properties of functors plus a little bit extra. So a little bit fancier than functors. So maybe that's why some people think they're very scary. They're very natural, as we will see. Well, I hope at the end that you actually believe me that they are very natural. So kind of the idea and the whole idea of category theory in the end is that we take the category theory takes itself very, very serious and should always look for errors. So this means you should look for errors between objects and then for errors between errors and then for errors between errors between errors and for errors between errors between errors between errors. I hope I got the number of errors correct and so on. So really we get this infinite letter of, of notions. Um, usually you cut it off at the, uh, natural transformations because it's kind of a two-dimensional object and our brain kind of can digest two-dimensional geometry really well and with three dimensions it's a little bit eh, <laughs> with four dimensions it's already way beyond me anyway. Uh, so that's why kind of usually in the kind of this classical setup you never see the next step which would be called a modification. Um, the next step is, still has a name. Of course, if you have infinitely many steps, and at one point you don't write, want to write down any, any names anymore, you would like to give it a simple type of name, right? It's a, it's a natural transformation of dimension 15 or something like that. Anyway, so here's a picture. So I usually like to draw categories as universes, but actually that picture is wrong. I should draw categories as points. Categories are zero dimensional from the viewpoint of category theory. That's kind of the whole point. Categories are unimportant from the viewpoint of category theory. It's a point. It's just a point. Here's a category which is just a point, and another category which is just a point. And a functor is now, a t well, this is in the category of categories, right? Op uh, uh, objects are categories, and um, arrows are functors. So functors are actually two dimensional, one dimensional objects. So this is one dimensional, this is zero dimensional. And a natural transformation is nothing else than a filling uh, of the space between two functors. Usually, uh, the, def the notation here involves this double arrow. It's kind of a standard notation. But anyway, you should think of it as a two-dimensional two -dimensional filling of the space between the functors. So this is really two-dimensional. So zero-dimensional, one-dimensional, two-dimensional. And yes, those funny modifications that I mentioned before would be a three-dimensional space filling in kind of, kind of object built from natural transformations, so from uh, faces. So you can also think of this as being some kind of topological space here. So you have vertices, you have edges, you have faces, and it's uh, natural transformations. And you can, of course, think this further than you can have volumes or four-dimensional volumes or whatever, something like that. But right now, I only want to stay with zero, one, and two-dimensional. I said again, because it's a little bit shocking. So categories actually, from the viewpoint of category theory, they're so unimportant, they're zero-dimensional from the viewpoint of category theory itself. I still illustrate them as universes, but actually they should be points. Uh, with points, I usually have the problem that I would like to put symbols inside and the point is a little bit too small to put symbols inside. So I usually have those beefed up, has those beefed up points, which a little bit look like a, a universe or a circle. Actually, they look like a circle because I can't illustrate universes. But anyway, that's a, that's a different type of topic here. So let's try to think what it should be. What should be a natural transformation if you believe the strategy that it should be an arrow between an arrow? So it should be a map between a functor. So what is a functor doing? Well, a functor does the following. It takes a line, if you want, it's kind of the easiest type of diagram you can imagine. And it associates to a line, a line, right? It just puts F everywhere. So this would be F of A. Uh, sometimes people write it without brackets. So let me just use the, the notation on the, uh, that I have here from the picture that I, of course, still link into the description, and then you would have an f of f. So a functor sends a line to a line. Okay, and now you want to map between functors. So what do you actually associate to a line? Well, a functor sends a line to a line. And so another functor sends a line to another line, the same line to another line. 
So what you really should draw between those functors is a square, right? You should connect the lines. I'll say it again. So a functor associate a line to a line, a diagram to a diagram. Just a line is kind of the simplest form of a diagram, which is not completely trivial. There's at least one error somewhere. And so um, a natural transformation then should be this two-dimensional way of thinking. So it should associate to a line actually a square. So this whole square here that you see here is what, what you would see under a natural transformation. And kind of the standard notation for natural transformation is to use Greek letters, and I will kind of try to follow that. So a natural transformation is denoted by alpha. Right? It's a map between functors, and here's a notation. I have functors f and g, and have an alpha between them, I have an arrow between them. So I should have said map, I should have said arrow. Um, it's a correct type of map between or arrow between functors. And you should really think this for further. It's a really higher dimensional operation. So uh, I, F, a functor, associates a commutative diagram to a commutative diagram. So here's a commutative diagram. And here's a simplified picture of the, of the above. So just actually, you should just look at the simplified picture anyway. And we're going to the simplified picture in a second. So that's what F does. And also my G here, and it does the same. So here, this diagram goes to this diagram. So what is now my uh, eta? So again, my natural transformation, what is it supposed to do? Well, it should associate this whole setup to this polytop here, which connects the two commuting diagrams here, right? And just the whole polytop. That's kind of what you should see under a natural transformation, right? This big polytop here, um, where one functor is here, one functor is here, and the natural transformation is this two-dimensional type of object between them, the polytop. So a functor, in other words, is about commuting diagrams. A natural transformation, which, by the way, I always abbreviate. It's, it's, it's a mouthful. It's just a mouthful. And I like to abbreviate it to not treffer. So whatever, <laughs> natural transformation. Anyway, I start over again. A functor is about commutative diagrams. A natural transformation is about commutative polytops, if you want. Um, kind, of the, kind of connect the diagrams in, in time, if you want. That's, that's a higher dimensional. Kind of operation and you kind of can uh, think about now what the modification that the next step should be i just can't draw that anymore and kind of that's why well probably not because i can't draw it anymore people don't consider them so much um probably because it's just really hard to imagine higher dimensional objects anyway so at one point you kind of stop anyway kind of kind of natural it's kind of naturally built into our brains to stop at one point yeah and actually we just cooked up so Congratulations, we just discovered the definition of a natural transformation. It really is a mapping um, that such a this diagram exists. So what does this mean? Uh, actually, really now it associates to align the square. The square is, of course, kind of the basic building block. Um, as I tried to say on the previous slide, in general, you would associate to a commutative diagram, kind of a huge polytop on this diagram. Um, but of course, the square is kind of the easiest one, it's built from the line. And what it does, it associates to each object a certain type of arrow. And usually you denote that by, well, I, I still go with eta here. And you denote that by eta x. And it goes from f of x to g of x. So it's kind of this extra step in the dimension. And you have that for every object because you kind of want to do that everywhere, right? So this is this extra step in the dimension, eta y. And the rest comes from the factor. So here's the first part of this, it's the f factor. And here's the G functor. And this is how you build your, um, your square. So um, if you want, then um, the natural transformation is not, it's just a square. It's just a natural transformation square. And this is kind of the tip of the iceberg, as I said. The next step would be called modifications. And if you think about it a little bit, you will actually be able to write down the definition of what a modification should be. It should be an arrow between natural transformations. So it should take everything up to the next dimension. And that's a bit hard to illustrate. So that's, I'm not, what, that's why I'm not going to do it as I said. Okay, um, it's actually not so easy to construct examples of natural transformation because they're already kind of type of higher dimensional objects to begin with. But here's a very cute one which you might not have seen before. The determinant is actually a natural transformation. The determinant can be interpreted as a natural transformation. So uh, this is a setup. I again have my points which uh, illustrated as universes. So I have my 
a category here of commutative rings on one side, and I have a, my category here of groups uh, on the other side. And well, the factor that I'm going to use are two different factors. Uh, one of them associated associates to a commutative group, that's the bottom one, um, just all invertible elements. So what would I do? I would associate to Z, uh, well, what are the invertible elements of Z? That's plus or minus one. I would associate to Q, what are the invertible elements of Q? It's everything except zero. So usually people call that QX or Q star. I just go with QX here. So it's a it's X factor. It, it associates to a commutative ring. It's group of units. Well, very easy. It's a group of unit functor. Um, and there's another nice functor. It's called GLN. So general linear matrices. Um, it also goes from um, Z, for example, to general linear matrices. Um, on the other side, I haven't illustrated that anymore. So this is, of course, not the target of GLN from Z. It would be uh, Z valued GLN matrices, right? So say for Q. For Q, it may be more standard. It would be just uh, invertible matrices with elements from Q. So these are two factors. You can check that they're actually two factors between uh, commutative rings and groups. So maybe there's a natural transformation between them. And yeah, there is one. And it's a determinant. The determinant can be interpreted as a natural transformation between this GLN functor and the group of units functor. And why does it work? Well, because you have the square. So I just wrote, there's not any space anymore on this slide. So here's the um, square from the other side. So here, the natural transformation square, the bottom one here. It's just in, in algebra, it's just this equation. Um, and here it's just the same. So the determinant actually is defined by the same formula for any commutative ring. So it kind of commutes with taking uh, the GL and that's exactly what happens here uh, for the natural transformation square. So um, the determinant is a really cute example. The determinant is a natural transformation between the general linear and the group of units which I think is, as I said, a really, really cute example. Uh, okay, let me wrap up. So natural transformations is really the following. So a functor is about commutative diagrams. It's kind of a graph theoretical uh, object, right? It's kind of a one dimensional object. A natural transformation is more like you take this object and you, you move it in time to another place. So actually what you get is more type of a polytop. So the natural transformation is more about commutative polytops. And you can obviously think that further, you can think about those modifications the maps between uh, natural transformations and you could think about maps between modifications and you get higher and higher dimensional structures that are harder and harder to control, um, partially because our brain just likes to think two dimensional, at least my brain likes to think two dimensional. Secretly, we are living in a, in a four dimensional space if you take uh, space and time. But our brains are really, really bad of doing, I should say my brain is really, really bad of kind of distinguishing higher dimensions. So uh, if to me, it kind of makes sense why kind of classical category theory stops at those natural transformations. So um, it stops at the point of a two dimensional object, if you want. And if you wonder now, yeah, you can now write down a category, uh, the category of functors between certain categories where now the arrows are natural transformations. And if you're a big fan of this notion, I'm not going to do that uh, right now, maybe in a later video, you can actually now write down a higher category, a two category of categories where the objects are categories, the maps between categories are functors and the maps between maps are natural transformations, right? That's what this is all about. Category theory takes itself extremely serious. So you should always look for the arrows between the arrows, between the arrows, between the arrows. And that's what natural transformations in the end are all about. In any case, I hope you enjoyed the video and I also hope to see you next time.